Good evening, everyone. Um, we'll get started in about a minute. If anyone wants to grab a seat who's up the back and wants to be a bit closer, there are some uh, spare seats still down the front here. So please um, move into your seats if you would like a, a closer seat for those people up the back. All right, I think we'll get started. Um, thank you everyone for coming this evening. My name's Penny Kasler. I'm from the State Emergency Service. We're the control agency who is looking after the River Murray flooding event that you would all be aware of. Um, so we've got some guest speakers tonight who are gonna provide you with information. Um, just before we start the um, official meeting, I'd like to just give an acknowledgement of country. The SES acknowledges traditional owners of, the, of country throughout Australia and recognise the continuing connection to land, waters and communities. We acknowledge the first people of the River Murray as custodians of the region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living people throughout the area today. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders cultures and to Elders past and present. So welcome everyone, um, thank you for coming. I hope all of you realise that we did a last minute change of the venue, um, so I'm sorry if some of you came via the Manham Football Club, um, but we uh, realised at the last minute that we may have not had enough room in the Manham Football Club, so the council kindly organised um, this venue instead for the SES to use. So um, thank you to the council for all of their help, they've been great in organising um, flyers and promoting the event and printing out information for me that um, I left on my desk at home. Um, so <laughs> they've been very, very helpful to us. Um, so the format of the night is we've got about 10 agencies here to give you information about the event that's happening with the River Murray and the water that's coming down. Um, what I'd like to do is let each of those 10 agencies talk. They're going to each um, give you a short spiel about what they are doing in the background to assist each and every one of you. Um, we'll hold questions until the end and once all of these speakers have spoken then we'll open the floor to questions. If you do not get a chance to ask your question at the end or you want to um, remain anonymous with your question, we actually have some yellow post-it notes and some pens up on the table underneath the uh, basketball hoop and also the table over by the left. So please feel free to write any questions that you want to ask any of the agencies on a post-it note. And then we actually have some big white sticky sheets around there. I've got people lined up against each one of them by accident over there. Um, and then across uh, this wall as well. So you'll see some big white sticky sheets one of them says SA Water, one of them says SA Power Networks, one of them says SA Police, one of them says SES, one of them says your local council. So if there's any questions you want to ask that you don't get a chance to ask, please put your sticky notes up there with your questions on it. The reason why we're really keen to get your questions is because all of the agencies are actually working to put information on their websites and into fact sheets and get information out there for you. Now, they're all assuming that they know what you want to know, but at the end of the day, we actually need to make sure that we're providing information, all of us are providing information to you that you actually need to know and want to know about. So please tell us what those questions are so that we can make sure that we get answers for you um, out into the community. All right, so um, what I'd like to do now is just open up to the first um, speaker. So the first speaker that we have is 
Mike Baker. Mike is a Deputy Incident Controller with SES, so he'll be giving you a little bit of a summary of where SES are at with this event at the moment. Great, thanks Penny. Uh, yeah, Mike Baker from the SES, so I'm the current Deputy Inc Incident Controller for the Riverland uh, IMT. Uh, that IMT is based in Loxton. Uh, and working with a number of other agencies. Um, that IMT is working uh, seven days a week, uh, full time, in order to uh, take control of this incident that is from well, within the area of operation from the border with Victoria down to uh, the, the mouth. So currently, uh, the situation is as of today, uh, across the border, we're experiencing 89 gig, gigalitres of water uh, crossing uh, from Victoria into South Australia. Those flows are expected to increase to 100 gig um, by the 12th of November, and that's across the border, not currently here at Madam, 100 gig at the border. Um, and as uh, the Premier announced yesterday, uh, the anticipated flows have reached 150 gig, uh, which we expect to see in early December. With that figure of 150 gig, um, our current contingency planning and everything that we're working to as a control agency is at 180 gig. So we are working um, to a higher level just to maintain confidence and to be able to provide accurate information uh, just in case and making sure that we're in an organised manner. These flows will be the highest flows that we've seen since the 1970s. In addition to the incident management team that we have uh, working uh, seven days a week uh, until the uh, end of this event, we are also supported by what we call a zone emergency support team. So the members of that zone emergency support team include uh, the relative agencies behind me, but also many more of a coordinated effort of government in order to provide that information and be prepared to support not only your community, but all the communities along the River Murray area of operation. Sitting behind that zone support team is also the state control centres. Uh, so there are many coordinated efforts going on within government to ensure that all the key players and support players are communicating and providing the best information and intelligence interagency to make sure it is a coordinated effort. So we're well aware that in the lower parts of uh, the River Murray, that we're already starting to see some impacts. We have extensive flood modelling uh, and inundation mapping. Uh, some of you may have seen the mapping that's up on the walls. I do encourage you to refer to that um, and look at what uh, is relevant to you, your situation, your property. Uh, and we will be after, uh, available after this to help you find your properties or to talk through um, some of those risks. I'll leave the forecast uh, situation uh, to DEW to discuss, um, just in essence of time. Currently within uh, our area of operation, we have two types of warnings, or two areas of warnings. Uh, that is split up to the, the upper part of the Murray and to the lower part of the Murray. Currently, both parts of the Murray are in a watch and act. So that was, I believe, updated in the last half an hour or 45 minutes. Um, so I'd refer you to uh, that messaging uh, and take the actions that are described in there. Um, but you'll see a lot of warnings um, of the Watch and Act and similar coming through your devices regularly over the coming weeks. As far as websites are concerned and where to find the most relevant information about this event, I'd like to direct everyone to the sa.gov.au website. 
that is a coordinated website where all agencies are putting information into. So if you're looking for one, uh, a one-stop shop of information, please access the sa.gov.au website. There may be some questions about where to access sandbags in order to help you, the community, prepare for this event. Very shortly, we're hoping to release some locations uh, about where you are able to access sandbags, sand and assistance. Uh, and one of those locations is in this town. Uh, we're just working on the final details uh, and the final preparations, but uh, keep an eye on that sa.gov website and we'll also be pushing it out through social media about the finer details. What is important to understand is that we do have time to prepare for this event. We're, we are uh, fortunate that unlike other events where we've often got 20 minutes to prepare, we do have time on our side and we encourage you to uh, look at that information and take action that you see as most relevant to you and your own personal situation. Make plans um, and consider whether or not to stay or to go. Some assistance can be provided with that information or you know, the decisions you need to make as an individual or a family and that is again all together on the sa.gov AU website. A couple of circumstances that we'd like to, uh, we encourage you to consider is your medical uh, considerations, social, financial. Uh, you may uh, have risk of inundated roads and access requirements. Uh, you may wish to consider resupply, food or uh, your medication. All of those things feature in your decision making of whether to stay or to go. With your decision, please inform your friends or your family, and if you change your mind about what you are doing, please keep those people in, uh, in the loop on your decision making. We are currently working with a number of agencies in our IMT, uh, and that includes emergency relief and recovery. So even though we are at the very start of this event, uh, please rest assured that we are already working and forecasting throughout this event and to the end of the event um, to understand what needs of community are required. Um, I won't say too much to steal uh, the thunder, but uh, yeah, that is definitely a consideration and they're already embedded within our IMT. For your personal safety for the upcoming weeks, please remain astute of the risks of flood water. We recommend that no one plays, walks or drives through flood water. If your uh, hobbies or your career is on the water, um, you uh, are most likely very well experienced, but just remember the unique environment that we're currently in. And I think that is most of what I have to take. Uh, so moving forward, I can just really hammer home that please access that sa.gov.au website. And if you have any storm or flood needs, uh, emergency needs, uh, the best access to those is through 132500. Thanks, Mike. Um, now, you'll probably hear a few phone numbers tonight from various speakers. Um, virtually everyone has got fact sheets and brochures and things um, already here tonight or up on their website. Um, but all of our phone numbers are on all of our brochures. So um, if you hear phone numbers and you don't quite, quite grab them, um, that's fine. Grab the brochures at the end. We've got plenty of brochures and those phone numbers will be on those brochures. All right, now um, at the back of the, the room over on this side, you'll see some big maps over there. Um, they are examples of the flooding maps that have been developed by Department of Environment and Water. We sometimes refer to them as Jew, so if you hear us talking about Jew, that's who they are. 
Um, we've got some maps that are relevant to Manham, but we've also brought maps down that are relevant to other areas of the river. Um, we've got, uh, so the whole river has been mapped, all 637 kilometres kilometers of it by June. Um, so we literally could not bring every single map that is available, but all of those maps are available on the Department of Environment and Water website. And you can go onto those maps and actually drill into your particular location. And then you can look at what inundation there might be at various levels. So you, you might put in, what does it look like at 100 gigs a day? What does it look like at 140 gigs a day, etc.? So you can actually go in and have a look at what, what is predicted in those areas under um, various uh, levels of water coming through. So I'd like to now introduce Chrissy Bloss, who is from the Department of Environment and Water, and she'll talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Chrissy Bloss. I'm the manager of River Murray Water Delivery in the Department for Environment and Water. Um, and our role, of the department, our department has a lot of um, things to do with River Murray, but uh, I really wanted to talk to you tonight about um, the role we're providing in regards to uh, flow forecasting um, and inundation and water level prediction. Um, so we uh, regularly uh, speak with our upstream counterparts who are predicting, uh, watching the flow come down uh, through the, the Murray, the Murray Bridge and the Darling systems and providing advice to us on what a likely flow will be at the SA border. Um, at the moment, the advice is that it'll be at least 150 gigalitres per day at the border and potentially up to 180. So a couple of things to put into context. Um, traditionally, uh, flow measurement in South Australia of Murray has been related to the flow at the border. Um, however, I know a lot of people are more interested in the gauge levels, the water level gauge near their property, and so that information is also available um, on, the, on the website, the, the flow report, the links. So if we speak about 160 or 180, then you can go to each individual town and look at what we predict that the water level will be for that flow. So I'm largely talking in terms of uh, flow rate because it's, um, it, it does stay fairly, I won't say, say constant, there aren't any major rivers coming into the Murray within South Australia, and generally the flow might reduce by, say, 10 to 20 gig on its way down the river. So if we have a flow of, say, 150 gig at the border, it might be sort of 140 or 130 by the time it reaches um, the bottom part of the river. There's only two really good spots to measure flow in the Murray in South Australia. That's at the border and at Lock 1. So uh, we might see it reduce a bit on the way down. So. One of the things to note about those flood maps is that to be conservative, to not uh, unintentionally underestimate the extent, it does assume that sort of flow stays pretty constant all the way down. Uh, but they are calibrated to a flow at lock one for this part of the area. Going back to the flow forecast, uh, at the moment there's a peak moving down the Murray uh, on the border between Victoria and South Australia. That peak is currently in a really complex part of the river system, they call the, the Murray uh, Edward Wakul part where most of the flow is actually not going down the Murray, it's going down uh, what is an ancient path of the Murray, the Edward River and also the Wakul River. It's really, really hard to predict, which is why we're providing a range at the moment and why those forecasts might change going forward. Uh, you'll see the forecasts have been increasing and that's because uh, some of the water levels at those locations has been increasing more than was predicted. It's, it's not just a flow, it's also a volume uh, of water that's come down from those previous uh, flood events in the Upper Murray, in the Gold, in the Ovens, Campaspe rivers, it is difficult to predict. So we're going to continue to pro provide a range until that flow gets close to the border and then we can really start to narrow in better what the actual forecast is. So please, when you hear those that information about the forecast flow, we really are encouraging people to look a bit higher at the top end of that range and just to see, uh, would I be impacted at a higher forecast if the forecast was to be updated in future? Because we just it's just really, really difficult to predict at the moment. These flows haven't been seen you know, for over 40 years. Catchments change, the channel changes, levees are built, levees are removed, things change. And so we're doing our best to estimate a flow at the moment, but there's still a range of uncertainty. So we just want people to be aware that a big flow is coming and that those forecasts might change with time. At the moment, that range of 150 to 180, to put that into context, the uh, 1975 flood was 162, and the 1974 flood, the big one in November 74, was 182. So we're looking at something around the kind of the 75, 74 kind of flood at the moment. 
depending on where the forecast goes. So for those who remember those events, that's the kind of impact we're looking at at the moment. It could change. Um, got a list of things here to talk about. So talk about the uncertainty. Ah, so we, uh, it's going to take, so at the moment the peak is forecast to reach the border in that first week of December. Um, it's going to take a couple of weeks to get down to here, so you're looking at a peak probably mid to late December. That information uh, we keep updated on, on the links you get to via the sa.gov website. At the moment they're in our, um, in the Department for Environment and Water Flow report, uh, which provide our estimates of timing of the peak arriving at different locations down the river within South Australia and also a forecast water level. It also includes in there uh, peak water levels from previous flood events. So you can look at it and go, and if you are older than me and old enough to remember what the 74 flood looked like or the 75 flood looked like, you can look at what our, our forecast level estimate is relative to those historic floods and go, it was higher, it was lower, that kind of thing. So help you people provide some context around what the flood might look like when it gets here. Um, and one thing we are going to update is also to provide what water level those inundation maps relate to, just so that uh, not just the flow, because the flow can change up down the time, but also if you can see that at the 160 gig map, for example, that your property is not flooded, you can say, well, that 160 gig map assumes that the water level at that location was X and that kind of thing. So we're just going to add a bit more information about that. Uh, a couple of other things. At the moment, the mapping extends as far south, as far down the river as Wellington. Uh, for the time being, we believe that the lower lakes, we can manage the lower lakes within its uh, operating range in then some. We, we, we think that we can keep the lakes to below one metre AHD, which is within its normal operating range. So there's no flood warnings current for the lower lakes. And also that's why there's no flood mapping shown around the lower lakes is because we believe that we can pass a flow peak through the lower lakes um, without raising the water levels in that location. But of course, upstream of Wellington, um, increasing there will be uh, flood levels. We are managing the lakes uh, to push as much water out as possible when we can. We have enough gates open. Um, opening more gates at the barrages is not going to um, affect uh, flood levels significantly, sort of as far up here as uh, Madam. Another note, of course, particularly in this part of the river, uh, it is notoriously difficult to um, predict flood levels this part of the river because often you'll get those um, winds, wind effects can push water levels up by, you know, a foot or two here, um, half a metre. It is, it, that, we can't take that into account in our modelling. We, we, we can't always predict what the wind could do. So even though uh, we will have predicted water levels, particularly in this part of the river and, and downstream towards the lakes, the wind can really push the water upstream and there can be higher water levels than, than predicted. And at times, there's been higher water levels than the flood peak itself at times because you have such really big wind sage effects. I've got a few more um, comments about the, the flood mapping itself. It is done to a 10 metre grid, so it is approximate in locations. It also assumes that uh, it, it is based on some ground level data from around 2010, so uh, things like levees and things are in the condition they were at that point in time. It can show where levees are overtopped, but it can't show where levees uh, fail through other means, like it's got a, a, you know, a, a structural fault or things like that. Um, and it does, and with regards to inundation behind the lower Murray Banks, uh, we're actually ref asking people to, to refer to some other information on our website, which has got some better, more current survey data for the crest levels of those banks um, about which ones uh, may be over top. But it's, uh, I think the flows are talking about that 150 gig plus, we do, we do predict that many of those um, uh, areas behind the Lower Murray Banks, we'll get some water into them with those kind of flows. Um, so at the moment, and just one last point actually, is that um, the, those inundation maps there are available uh, as a PDF, but um, I think as mentioned earlier, there's also a mapping portal with the links are on the uh, sa.gov website where uh, there's a whole flow range, um, not just the the, um, the 140 or the 160 gigaday flow range we've been talking about, but right up to 180, 200, 250, 300, all the way up to 956 flood level that we've modelled as a prediction of where water could go to, can zoom in and out, that kind of, it's more of an interactive portal as well. So um, I hope uh, that those maps are, are one quite easily uh, downloadable product, especially around the towns. There's actually another more, more complicated mapping portal behind it 
people can have a look at and, and, and see where the inundation is expected to get to for, for their property. I think that's probably about everything I wanted to say tonight. And um, but yeah, certainly um, uh, happy to take questions on the on the mapping later on. Thanks very much, Chrissy. All right. Um, the next person I'd like to ask to talk is Ben Scales, um, CEO of your local council. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Penny, and uh, welcome everyone tonight. Um, look, Council's uh, been working with the SES as a lead agency on the, the ZEST, which was mentioned previously uh, since September. Um, from a governance perspective, we've instigated our critical incident management team and also our business continuity plan and team. Um, we've also activated our recovery plan. Our focus is on preparedness at the moment, but we also need to consider what recovery looks like and we'll work with the relevant agencies. Uh, we've undertaken flood mapping um, of the river and all of our assets and areas up to 200 gigalitres per day. We hope that it doesn't get to that, Chrissy, but um, obviously we want to be prepared and make sure we know. And as I said, um, sorry, as Chrissy's mentioned, really encourage you to have a look at, your, at the mapping for your areas. Um, our priority has been our asset risk assessment, flood mitigation strategies um, to protect and preserve people and assets. So with, this has included our swims, which have been decommissioned um, in those locations where they're at um, on a case-by-case -case basis, subject to flood mapping and um, road closures. Um, also, you need to be aware that the South Australia, the, uh, the power network, SAPN, will also switch off power. Um, we don't get prior notice of that, so um, we obviously need to protect the assets and the switchboards of the swim systems. Um, so we'll be um, decommissioning them as required. Our road closures, you would probably be aware, Council's got 3,000 kilometres of road network. Um, we are currently predicting that about 250 kilometres of that road network will be um, impacted by inundation um, and will result in um, closures to protect the assets. Um, so we'll again try to communicate as, uh, as early as possible. We were doing it um, you know, within a couple of weeks' notice, um, but as the river rises and inundation happens quickly, um, we'll have to make quick decisions on that and we'll communicate that as quickly as possible and um, to give you as much notice as we possibly can. Um, we've done some levy bank assessments. Um, we've had to manage our marine structures, whether that's pontoons and boat ramps, and we'll continue to do that, and also looking at priority assets up and down the river. Um, and as you'd be aware, our region goes from Cadell um, all the way just past uh, Manham. From a community perspective, we've been working with the SES on the sandbagging locations that as were mentioned by Mike. Um, we had seven operating on the weekend. Um, across the, the district. Um, we've transported at this point um, 1,500 tonne of sand um, and we think that'll be 2,000 tonne by the end of the week. I think that's um, around uh, 68 truckloads um, and then up to 90 by the end of the week. So working with the SES to do that, we obviously know that um, sandbagging um, uh, access has been somewhat of an issue, but we're obviously working on that, and I think we're going to, as Mike mentioned, we're going to have some permanent locations hopefully announced in the next day. Um, we've uh, communicated and, and existing camping facilities for people that may be displaced um, as the water continues to rise, um, and we've communicated that throughout the region. Um, we're working on a site here in Manham and in Blanchetown, um, but obviously there's already existing sites around, but we are aware. Um, that Manham um, doesn't have one other than the caravan park at the moment. Um, so we're working on that and hopefully we'll finalise that in the next day for um, those impacted residents. Um, obviously there's agencies that are working with displaced residents as well, which you'll hear from tonight. Um, and we're also assisting the agencies with vulnerable people. Um, from a development perspective, um, there's no mechanism in the Act um, that allows, allows works without development approval. Um, but we are using the emergency building works um, for so, sorry for such emergency building works such as um, constructions of levees for one of a better term um, or you know uh, adapting mooring poles. Um, but uh, we under the section 135 of the Planning Development and Infrastructure Act um, allows for work to be undertaken where there is a risk to persons or buildings. Um, and so we've developed a process. Uh, around that to make sure that people can get on and do the work they can because obviously the time process is to apply for a development application um, won't help in an emergency situation such as this. And we're also seeking some amendments to the regulations to enable emergency works. 
So from a process perspective for if you have to do emergency works, and I want to stress it is for emergency works with a flood inundation, not just because you might want to do some works on a shed. Um, notify council of your plan works uh, and then submit a development application as soon as practical. So we're not saying you have to have the DA process and approve prior, um, but you do need to let us know. Um, and then we have our, obviously our council planners that can be spoken to to get um, specific advice and accurate advice. Uh, one point I really want to be clear on that um, you need to consider the impact of any works that might have on um, your neighbours, on their property or their assets as well. Um, there might be unintended consequences. We don't want anyone to be building a pyramid and then obviously that affects the neighbouring property because the water has to go somewhere. So it's about being considerate of um, everyone in this challenging circumstance. Um, from a financial support perspective, um, and relief. Um, this will be raised with the new council, you might be aware, and if you haven't, you've got till tomorrow afternoon at 5pm to vote. Um, uh, we have a new council will be elected on the weekend, um, so we have a meeting on the 22nd of November and we'll have a discussion with them around financial support and relief and whether that be um, service charges, um, relief or rate deferrals, etc. Um, but I just wanted you to know that's um, definitely on the card for this. You know, we're, we're aware that some services that council provide won't be able to be provided, whether that's waste um, or TV in Bow Hill, for example. Um, so we're considering those things. Uh, from a tourism perspective, um, obviously we're really encouraging and you know, working with the SATC about safe visitation. Um, you know, the river looks amazing. Obviously it's creating some challenges as well. Um, so we do want to encourage people not only to continue to visit. Um, you know, our region uh, relies on tourism um, and there's so many businesses that um, obviously uh, really rely on that you know, across the peak season of summer. Um, so we do are encouraging working with the SATC about that safe visitation. Um, and we also encouraged by the Premier's comments on considering um, tourism support or support for those industries, not tourism, um, that are financially struggling. So we hope to hear some announcements. Um, maybe Adrian, you can uh, you know, poke uh, and uh, keep pushing that as well. From a communications perspective, um, We've talked about the SA Gov site being the source of truth. Uh, we've got a dedicated web page as well, um, which directs to the relevant agencies. So um, if you do need information, that is there. But um, obviously, the um, SA Gov website is probably the, the, it is the source of truth. So um, we are updating our digital channels regularly. Um, and we're distributing an EDM on Friday afternoon with updated information, including swim closures, road closures, and impacts to our infrastructure in the district. Um, so I encourage everyone to sign up that, which uh, we're just putting a link on there to actually be able to sign up on the website or you can email council to get on that. Now we're also aware not everyone has email access or internet access, um, so I encourage you um, if you don't or can't access that, you can come into any of our offices um, and uh, our staff will be able to help you either print something out or um, we have computers and terminals in each of these offices for the community to access. Um, so if you do need uh, support in that. Um, as I said, we are focusing on preparedness. Um, but we also want to start, and our community team are starting to consider recovery. Um, and so we're reviewing our recovery action plans at the present. Um, and these are based around social, built environment and environmental impact. Um, sorry, economic impact. Um, and finally, I think that's all. And happy to answer questions later, Penny. Um, but also want to acknowledge the work um, of the SES as the lead agency and the other agencies that are represented here um, to my council staff and Dave Hassett specifically, um, the work that's been going on for months in this and um, you know, really appreciate that. And also the support of the other councils. You know, we've had metropolitan councils um, truck up sandbags um, uh, for vulnerable people that can't fill them and, and do that. So um, you know, this is a team effort. And my last message is obviously you know, be kind, consider those that can't help themselves um, we're all in this and, um, you know, we're a strong community and we should be working together um, to support each other. So, Penny, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, and Ben's just actually reminded me of something that we're just organising um, this afternoon. So this is hot off the press. Um, we've received a lot of questions about shack owners who don't necessarily live in the area and how can they get to public meetings. So we've actually just put a call out to the councils down in Adelaide for someone to provide us with a venue down there so that we can actually hold um, a meeting in Adelaide for um, owners of, of shacks along the River Murray who can't get up to the River Murray to, to come to one of these meetings. So that's a really good example of how um, all the councils are helping each other out in this. 
All right, the next one I'd like to ask to talk is Donna. So Donna is from the Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Sometimes you will hear us talking about DIT, and this is DIT. Thanks, Donna. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry. Uh, my name's Donna Gray. Um, please excuse me reading from my paper. I'm actually filling in for our stakeholder engagement who's been doing these community meetings. So without reading off the paper, I'll probably give you some false information. So uh, my role in the department is a maintenance engineer lead um, for Zone 2. So from Clare down to Mount Gambier, um, everywhere other than the metropolitan area. We, um, we're based at Murray Bridge. Um, we have a small team, um, some of which work out of Adelaide. And um, we've been trying to uh, make sure that we can work with the mapping information to try and get an understanding of when each of the ferries uh, will go out of service, if that's applicable, as well as the fact, you know, some of our roads to the ferries, uh, even if the ferries are going to be able to be used, the roads to them still may be closed. So we've been gathering data and planning to ensure that our roads, ferries and marine environment continues to be a safe place for the community. With this information, I can advise that some ferries may need to close as the river rises, as they become unsafe at higher levels. The Wakery ferry will be the first one to reach this situation, but it also has, it's also the only ferry that has a second landing at a higher level, so it will reopen once the river reaches measurements to make sure that it's safe to use. Our marine team will be taking regular measurements to make sure we're timing of the closing and reopening of ferries with the safety of both public and ferry operators in mind at all times. At this stage, we're anticipating the ferry may only need to be closed for about a week, which is changing it from the lower landing to the higher landing, and works have already started um, for that Wakery ferry. Other ferries may need to close, including Morgan, Lyrup, Manham, Swan Reach, Walker Flat and Penong, with the department monitoring river levels and making those decisions based on flows. Our marine team are doing their best to ensure the ferries are keep running as long as they can safely uh, and we'll again use the websites to keep the community um, up to date as best as we can. The closures um, will also be dedicated, sorry, we have a dedicated page for ferry locations and operational status. In relation to the roads, all closures will have early warning systems using variable message signage placed at strategic locations and detour routes posted where applicable. The closures will be posted on the Traffic SA website uh, once they're in place. In regard to activities on the river itself, the Marine Safety Team asks all users of the Murray River to slow your speed and don't go out if the conditions are hazardous. River users need to watch hazards in the water due to the high flows, keeping in mind that some fixtures such as jetties, pontoons, may now be underwater where you can't see them. Always wear the correct life jacket when you're on the water, and our marine safety team have been carefully marking out hazards on the water with signage and yellow buoys. We encourage river users to report any hazards to our marine safety team through our report form on our website. I can add to that to say that um, there are different mechanisms that govern the use of um, the, the rivers. Uh, SAPO, I believe, have a certain level of delegation as well as our marine team. So where the waters actually um, rise, as Ju pointed out, the wind makes a difference to the levels, but also people in boats and um, powered equipment also make those issues which can affect um, you know, the housing or infrastructure on the lower levels. The road maintenance team are currently assessing which roads are likely to be subject to flooding and what details will be appropriate. It is not safe to drive into floodwaters at any time and if members of the public come across any dangers on the road including floodwaters, they can be reported 24 by 7 to the traffic management centre. 
Any road closures will be posted to social media and updated, as I said, on the Traffic SA website. All the details and web, uh, for websites and phone numbers I've mentioned are listed on a fact sheet that I've put on the table for anybody um, that needs one. And if they I do have some more, so if they do get taken, please come and see me and I'll, I'll give you another one. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. Thanks very much, Donna. Um, I should just say that the um, person from DIT who has been presenting at the meeting so far um, suddenly was away sick today and Donna um, literally got thrown in the deep end. So um, I do appreciate, thank you for, <laughs> for being able to step in at short notice. All right, um, next person I'd like to call up is Barb. I've lost you again, there you are. <laughs> um, Barb from Primary Industries and Regions SA. Sometimes you'll hear us talking about Persa and Barb is from Persa. Thanks, Barb. I keep changing sides, so I have sort of confused Penny a few times. Um, for those that don't know, my role in primary industries and regions is a regional coordinator for the Riverland and Murraylands, and I'm based in the Riverland, but uh, here in the Murraylands at least once or twice a week, so know the area pretty well. Um, we also have been modelling um, because that's what everybody does and we also have gone above the predicted levels. So we're fairly confident that um, where we know where the inundation is going to be from a primary industry perspective and in this, this area of the river it'll be predominantly um, annual cropping and obviously some dairy and there is a little bit of of tree but not a lot so we um, will continue to work with our growers and the industry especially on on that um, we also um, have responsibility for a few other things um, and obviously one of those in the upper reaches is fruit fly and uh, we'll continue to and just for everybody's information with the PFA um, pest free status um, uh, suspended, but we will also still be working to for, on the eradication program. However, if anyone has properties upstream, because obviously Mid Murray goes all the way through, um, we will have some challenges in access as well. So, like everybody else, roads will be congested. Um, we've got harvest coming, and obviously there's going to be some limitations with where where people can go. So we will have people out there, but like everybody, we'll be working with those challenges. Um, we also have responsibility for uh, livestock, so if anything gets really bad and there's any animals um, that are in danger, we will work with Animal Welfare League and, and RSPCA, and that's a, a given relationship and everybody is pretty aware of that one. Uh, Japanese and cephalitis, we don't have anyone from health here today, I don't think. So that now, there is a vaccine now available for anyone who lives in the River Corridor, so please contact your GP, get on the health website, there are clinics that, that do happen, um, and so that, that's now an option. We're also still monitoring varroa and foot and mouth, so things continue to be pretty, pretty busy there. Um, one of the things uh, we do have is we have, uh, and it gets a little bit complicated because um, as, as people would have heard, there's black water, so that deoxygenated water that will come down. And while we're not responsible for the management of the black water, that's a Department of Environmental Water, we're actually responsible for the fish kill. So the, we've, there's already been a commitment from the government for cleanup, and we've actually worked on a, um, a process now that we're putting in place for any substantial fish kills. So that responsibility uh, can at times be a little bit tricky, but that's been sorted out now already, and there is a commitment. Um, we also have um, our fab mentors, our farm and business mentors. We have three of them in the River Corridor. They're here for anyone who's running any form of business who might like to just have a chat about the business and uh, find out what sort of support is out there. Um, all their information is also on our website, which is linked to the sa.gov.au, or people can just find me and um, I can give you their details. Um, we also are here if anyone wants any clarification, doesn't know where to go, who to go to, we in Regions act as that sort of conduit, so please don't hesitate to call. And I'm going to end on a good note. 
because I haven't been able to do this before, but congratulations to everybody from my Palonga that's in the room tonight for winning Act Town of the Year. What a cool experience. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Bob. That's great news. Very good. All right. Um, I'd like to call up Tony Davis now from Housing SA. So Housing SA are responsible for um, organising relief centres. So Tony will give us some information about that. Good evening. I'm Tony Davis from the Emergency Relief Unit, which is part of... Oh, sorry. ..of Housing SA. Um, we are identified uh, during an, an event as the Emergency Relief Functional Support Group and tonight I've been asked to talk about relief centres. Closer. That's better. If members are unable to return to their properties, um, we are instructed by the State Emergency Centre to open up a relief centre. Uh, during the, um, this particular circumstance, we would uh, be looking at issuing some grants for some Im immediate um, help um, and also accommodation um, that needs to be approved by the Minister in the first instance. Uh, where are the re uh, relief centres located? Well, at this particular point in time, we've identified 300 sites through South Australia. Um, the State Emergency Centre in conjunction with the State Manager will identify a safe spot for staff and the community so that we can set up this um, relief centre and everybody can feel comfortable at that particular point in time. The idea of the relief centre initially is to produce a, a safe haven for people so people feel comfortable so that they can um, talk to us, let us know what their circumstances are and ourselves along with participating agencies can then uh, assist you with uh, any uh, form of uh, help that you may require. These uh, participating agencies are tremendous, Red Cross, Rotary, Lions, um, we all band together and uh, hopefully uh, we, you know, we have really great outcomes. Uh, and as uh, Mike alluded to before, all this information, including locations of uh, relief centres and grant information will be available on sa.gov.au. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, the next person I'm going to call up to talk is myself because uh, SA Power Networks, um, who have been coming to all of the meetings, unfortunately, um, was another late sickie today. Um, so they've sent me through their talking notes and I'm simply just going to talk to their notes because I'm not from SA Power Networks, so I can't add anything else. Um, but I will certainly talk to their notes and they have reassured me that uh, they're really keen for any feedback, so again, thinking about if you've got any questions, um, the best way to get hold of them will be to, to write your little messages on your yellow sticky notes with your pen and um, pop them on the, the white sheet that belongs to SA Power Networks. Um, so they're actively monitoring flood levels and continu continuously assessing which areas need priority. They're actually monitoring um, via helicopter and also boats where necessary. Uh, Low-lying regions at risk of flooding will be prioritised for disconnection. SA Power Networks will try to provide as much advance notice as possible where bulk disconnection of supply is likely to occur. As flood levels rise over the coming weeks, SA Power Networks may need to hurry up bulk disconnections to shack areas for the safety of the community and also their employees. Roads and tracks are being closed, which obviously restricts SA Power Network's access to various infrastructure. SA Power Networks will uh, organise urgent electrical alterations for local businesses, raising pumps and switchboards, etc. Customers need to engage a registered electrical contractor and ask them to raise an alter alteration request with SA Power Networks. Um, they do have a fact sheet here that people can take, so I'm, I'm presuming that most of this information is on their fact sheet as well. 
Um, ask the electrician to include River Murray flood in the job comment and that way it will get prioritised. Um, see our brochure for useful self-service options. SMS updates, this will ensure that you receive tailored outage updates and messaging for your property. So if anyone hasn't already uh, accessed the SMS updates, um, if you put your details on their sheet, they will actually add you to the list and that way they'll be able to S SMS you a message if your power is out in your area and it'll give you some information about how long it's likely to be out for. Excuse me. Safety advice. Um, if your property is likely to be flooded, it's best to make it electrically safe now before the waters rise. Switch off and unplug electrical appliances and where possible raise them well above potential flood levels. Check that you have a few working torches handy and turn off the main electrical switch at your switchboard. Get a qualified electrician to turn off and isolate your solar panels and if you have one installed, get them, if they can, to move a battery to a place of safety. Keep your mobile phone and other devices fully charged to keep in touch with updates or to report faults. During a flood, don't stay in a house or building that is inundated by flood water when the power is connected. Don't use any electri electrical appliances, sink or bath if you feel a shock or tingling sensation from any metal or plumbing. Avoid these appliances or objects and call us on 131366 to report the problem as soon as you can. Don't leave your vehicle if power lines have fallen across it unless you are in immediate danger. I hope that no one is ever in that situation in this room. That would be very frightening. Stay inside and call triple zero for help. If travelling by boat in floodwaters, don't try to raise or move any power lines you find. Don't try to travel under the power lines either as the rising waters will put you closer to them and potentially put you at risk of electric shock. Stay well clear of electricity poles, substations, fallen power lines and any objects in contact with them. If the electricity poles and wires are covered in floodwaters, then stay at least 150 metres away and call um, SA Power Networks to report it on 131366. One of the things we'd like you to do tonight after this meeting is start putting all these phone numbers into your phone so that you've actually got a bit of a... Um, a checklist there already on your phone of places and, and uh, places to call and people to call for help if you do see some of these things happening. Uh, there's an outage map. You can access the outage map using the code on our handout um, or log on to SA Power Network's website to view the map. You can also track flood related bulk, bulk disconnections via the map. Um, use the code on their handout to find useful quick links and latest River Murray flood updates. So their handout actually has a QR code that if you take a photo of with your phone, that will link you to a whole heap of information. So that's the information that would have been provided to you tonight by SA Power Networks. Um, our next talk, uh, sorry, our next speaker is from SA Water. Um, so I'd like to ask Joshua to come up. Thanks. Thank you, Penny. Okay, um, I do have some notes to go through, so I will refer to them just to make sure that I cover everything and give you uh, information accurately as well. And then, of course, very happy to answer questions afterwards. So to start, I will note uh, very importantly that there are currently no impacts to drinking water supply or quality or to wastewater operations. However, it is possible that some may arise as the situation unfolds further. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but please know that SA Water has been very actively preparing for these potential impacts um, along the whole length of the river uh, and really working to essentially the most extreme scenario uh, from the information that we've received through from uh, DW and which has been spoken about a little bit today already. Uh, but I'm going to have a little bit more of a focus specifically around Manum. Now I'm going to talk about three topics um, and I'm going to make it really clear when I move between and change topics as well. So the first topic that I'm going to cover off is drinking water services with a little more detail, then wastewater services and then operation of River Murray structures as well. So first up, drinking water services. Again, just to reinforce, there are currently no quality or supply impacts or interruptions to drinking water services. 
So talking about water quality for a moment and why this is important and why we think about it and it's a consideration, uh, we've heard very briefly tonight and you would all probably be very familiar with the term black water. Uh, which describes um, a condition of reduced water quality uh, in the raw water in the river, and that's a result of high levels of organic material and reduced dissolved oxygen levels. So to be clear as well, there is currently no black water in the South Australian section of the River Murray, but it may develop at some point. Now importantly, all of our water treatment plants along the river and all of our locations around the state as well, are designed to cope with water quality challenges in the raw water like black water. So they can treat the water to deal with that so that the drinking water that we supply through to the network is still safe and clean. Why we think about this though is because it does make that process harder and sometimes we might not be 100% successful with treating that water. And what that means or what that translates to on a customer and when we turn on our taps is that if the challenge became so large that our water treatment plants couldn't fully cope with processing that, is that we might see a little taste or odour difference in the water. So your tap water would still be clear it would still be clean and disinfected and safe to drink, but you might detect an earthy or musty odour or taste in there. Now importantly, this is at the more extreme end, and again I would just say the treatment plants are actually designed to cope with this kind of scenario. So it's on the less likely end of the scale. Um, looking at drinking water supply, so ability to actually maintain supply, the potential concern for us in this space would be whether or not one of the water treatment plants would be inundated with floodwaters, um, rendering it unable to actually process and push clean water through to the network. Um, now from our current modelling, and again we work to the worst case scenario here, we don't anticipate that there will be any significant issues of this nature. Now, specifically around Manum, um, all of our customers in this area receive uh, water from the Manum water treatment plant, which is on Chandler's Avenue. Uh, and we have a uh, model that that sits well above the forecast water inundation levels. Um, there is a location that we do need to do some more work on, and that's a pump station at Kawira, and that supplies a, a about three country lands. Um, and we need to do a little bit more work there to see what we can do to further protect that pump station. It pushes raw water through to the treatment plant. So that's still uh, very much a watching brief for us with some action there. Uh, but still, again, uh, no impact there at the moment. Uh, so another element of our planning is around making sure that we've got adequate treatment supplies on site and making sure that we're getting uh, deliveries of backup pumps and generators so that if we do have those power outages or some of those pumps fails, that we have uh, a backup there in place to try and maintain continuity of supply. Uh, now, in the event that any of our water treatment operations along the river are impacted and either affecting quality or supply, we will proactively communicate across both traditional and social media very actively at a high volume to let you know what has happened, uh, how we will support you through that and what we might need you to do in a practical sense as well. So I'm now going to talk about uh, wastewater services and uh, the different end of the spectrum of service there. Now again, just to start and reinforce, there are currently no impacts to our wastewater operations. However, our Manum wastewater treatment plant has been identified as one of our priority locations where we need to do some work. The potential concern at this location is that water levels could rise above the site's existing earth bank lagoon heights. Uh, that would then flow into those treated water lagoons uh, and potentially drag the treated wastewater out into the river. Now I want to be really clear as well 
uh, that these lagoons store cleaned and treated water. It is not raw sewage that is in there. That said, we still don't want it to just run out to the river freely. Uh, so we will be doing everything that we can do to avoid that. And there are options for us in that space. Uh, for example, while ever we have all of the infrastructure working okay, uh, we can actually increase uh, the use of that water for irrigation. It currently goes to the golf course and we've got an, what's called an emergency irrigation area as well, which is up above the wastewater treatment plant where we can safely um, disperse that water as well. Um, while we will be working to actively avoid that, and I'll touch on something else that we're doing as well in a second, um, we have considered what is that potential worst case scenario if um, water entered the lagoons and the um, cleaned and treated wastewater was dragged back out. And when we look at the volume or total volume of those lagoons, uh, maximum of 75 megalitre storage in there. And if we compare that to the flows that would be coming down the river on a daily basis, the potential modelling of the 150 to 180 gigalitres, uh, a gigalitre is 1,000 megalitres. Uh, so we're looking at a potential 75 megalitres in the uh, maximum in the wastewater treatment lagoons. Uh, as opposed to 180,000 megalitres on a daily basis. So the dilution factor for that is 99.6%. Okay. Uh, so also on our mind, oh, sorry, I would just, um, what we're doing and what we've actually started or will be starting on the weekend is um, uh, construction work to increase the height of the levees around the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, that's going up another 90 centimetres, uh, which against all of the modelling means that we will be well above the worst case scenario. Now the other scenario there that's on our mind is whether or not there is particularly low level, uh, low lying areas which would be inundated uh, and where that um, flood water would then infiltrate into the sewerage network. Now, our whole objective throughout this scenario will be maintaining or trying to maintain the biggest service area or maintaining active service for the largest part of the sewerage network for the longest time that we can so that everyone has the most normal experience. But there will be some low-lying areas that we might have to isolate from the network. That's literally that we put a, a bung in there, which is like a plug, and close parts off. Now, we can be quite refined in how that happens, and so that's what our team is busy working on throughout the rest of this week, so that we can map where we might need to do that. Now, when we've worked that out, which uh, hopefully will be for next week, uh, we will look to communicate individually with property owners in any of the affected areas to understand uh, what their plans are and to establish a communication channel with them so that we can provide notice before that happens. Okay, uh, some of the other activities that we've done are really the, um, the import and setup of, um, there's about 2,000 sandbags that have gone in around the wastewater treatment plant sites uh, switch room and chemical storage area, and that's again to try and protect those so that they keep operating at a most normal function. So as with the water treatment operations, the same thing for the wastewater is that it's, our planning is around making sure we've got the treatment supplies on site or close by, and that we've got those backup pumps and generators close by as well. And again, in the event that any of the wastewater network is compromised, uh, we will very proactively communicate with you across both traditional and social media um, and through any direct channels that we have, be that uh, email or phone, with people might have registered with us, uh, and potentially door knocking as well, because we will likely need you to take a practical response to that. So we will be very much seeking that response. 
Now, I'm now going to change topics just to operation of the River Murray structures, and this is just a quick mention. Chrissy did mention the barrages earlier, uh, and this is one of the other areas of our operations. Uh, and just to note that um, at the direction of either potentially whatever the asset is, uh, MDBA or DEW, um, the locks along the river are closed because the water levels are high, they just aren't actually needed in that way at the moment. Uh, so if you happen to be, uh, if you're a boatie and you're navigating, um, you can absolutely still get through. It's over the weirs and there are access channels that are clearly uh, signposted and marked there as well. And the lock attendants are still there uh, for interaction and can help guide people through as well. Uh, the barrages are being managed to release maximum flows. Um, an important point there also, um, often people aren't aware, is that they actually have, um, very similar to a reservoir, essentially a spillway. So if they get to a maximum point, um, that water will just go over and it won't actually be an active decision about holding it back. Uh, the other quick note is that dredging at the mouth is paused and that's because the flows um, of the river are so sufficient that they're keeping that open so it's not necessary at the moment. So, practical thing from me, if you have questions, uh, visit sa.gov.au um, and we will publish any information on any impacts that materialise as they do. Uh, please, if you're on um, social media, follow SA Water on Facebook uh, because we can uh, publish material there, but we can also use that as a really good channel to advertise and push content to you as well. If you have any questions, call us on 1300 SA Water. And my call out for you tonight as well is, uh, please consider, and uh, if you know whether or not we have your phone number. Uh, if you don't know that that's a yes, because you've not received um, SMS communication from us um, you know, recently because there might have been a service interruption, please consider calling us to register your phone number so that if there is a service interruption or a practical response that we need to talk to you about, we can um, get through to you. Thank you very much for that, Joshua. Um, all right, you'll be thrilled to know that is all of the guest speakers. Um, you've been sitting there getting a whole heap of information um, brought to you, so hopefully um, some of your questions have been answered. I guess just before I throw the, the um, mic over to the floor to take some questions, I just want to just summarise a little bit. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of agencies working behind the scenes to try and help keep you safe. But we really, really beg and plead of you to also start taking some action yourself. Think about what you've heard tonight and how you might be impacted. Um, everybody here, oh no, it's raining. <laughs> I was hoping that wouldn't happen. Okay, um, everybody here um, will be impacted differently. For some of you, you might have to drive a long way around, um, you know, to get around a ferry that's closed. Um, for others, you, you might be well above the waterline, but you, you keep your horses down at a lower level and you've got to move them. For other people, you might want to ask your, your managers if you can work from home for a couple of weeks. Um, some of you might actually want to consider relocating and think about who that might be um, you know, with. So you might say, look, perhaps I'd best go and stay with my sister who lives up at the top of the hill. So think about what you can do. Think about having things like torches and battery-powered radios, thinking about getting information, getting onto the internet and finding information that you might need, and also reaching out and helping those who might live near you or you might know who are vulnerable. So you might know that George lives next door and there's no way he gets on the internet. Um, so pop in and take some brochures to George and, and give him some information. We've got plenty of brochures, so please take as many as you like and pass them to as many people as you can. Um, I will now open the floor for any questions. So, yes, oh, I'm going to go right here. This is an easy one right at the front for me. Uh, yeah, my question is just directed to the council. I'm just wondering what they're planning on doing with uh, uh, rubbish pickups along the river roads where the roads may be closed. Very good question. I'll hand over to Ben, David. Thank you. Um, what we're looking at doing is, uh, uh, at present, we've uh, with some of the Jack areas, we've actually 
implemented uh, a slightly different service for those. Uh, where the roads will be closed, we've still got to work with Solo, the actual contractor, on, on, on how it is. Uh, and also we've got to uh, forecast what roads will actually be closed now with the, uh, the higher flows expected. So we'll, we'll do that modelling in-house in, in and uh, we'll work with Solo and then put that on our web pages as to how we'll, we'll deliver that service. Great, so I think the answer to that is go check with the local council. Um, I think there was a hand up over there, is that right? Yep. So the STED schemes? Okay, um, and I might just, I, I'm going to hand this to Ben, but I also should just say there might be some questions that we can't answer exactly tonight, but we can get back to you. But I'll give this to Ben. Uh, yeah, sorry. So SWIMS, which is a community wastewater management system, which is what steps are. Um, so we're managing them as uh, required. We've got mapping um, and we'll communicate out that when we have to make changes to them. So, yeah, so sorry, I mentioned SWIMS, um, but that's what a STED system is now called. Yeah, and um, as I mentioned in my presentation, that sometimes that will be impacted by SAPN because the SAPN will make a decision to turn the power off and so then we'll have to change that as well. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I'm not sure why the microphone's suddenly cracking. Yes. Hi. Um, we have a shack, and um, I've been up about three times because I've been told there's sandbags. Um, so I've been to Murray Bridge a few times. Um, how are they going to be allocated if we're not here all the time? And is the sand going to be continually supplied? That is a good question. Um, I might hand this one to Mike to answer. So uh, here we go, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so what we're looking at doing moving forward is identifying uh, a number of strategic locations along uh, River Murray communities where sandbags and sand will be made available throughout the entirety of this event. Uh, the details of those are hopefully going to be um, uh, finalised overnight and will be made available tomorrow. So just while we take some questions, I'll just try and um, keep the rest of the room quiet if we can to try and answer the questions. <laughs> That's right, we've got time for another couple of questions. So we've got one over here and then I'll come back to you and then over to you. Yeah, thank you. I'm just wondering, with all the modelling on uh, what's going on about the flow rate, um, is there uh, any anticipation of how long it will take to de-inundate? That's a good question. And one of the things that was said at the last meetings uh, that we've had earlier was that there is not a wall of water coming at you. It is going to slowly come up. Um, but I'll hand over to Chrissy to ask answer that question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there are extended flows coming down model parts of the catchment, uh, down the Darling, down the Murrumbidgee. At the moment, uh, we think that we will stay around the 150 gig a day mark or around that for probably four or five weeks, like all through sort of from uh, uh, December into January, and over 100 gig a day for uh, three months. So it's a long event. There is multiple flood peaks coming down the Darling Bowen River system and multiple peaks coming down the Murray and Bridgie system. So there's water going to be around for a long time. Thanks, Chrissy. Okay, I've got one question here and then I had a question over there as well. Yeah, I just want to know um, from Power Networks, how much notice can they give me before you shut the power off? Because you can have situations of hot weather and also you could lose all your food and everything else like that. So I think it needs to be a bit more reasonable if they can. Yeah, so um, SA Power Networks are not here this evening. They were a last minute um, called in sick. So if you want to put um, that question up on the SA Power Networks sheet, um, and if, if you're happy to, um, you can put your actual phone number up there. If you want to just give it to me to hand over, if you don't want to put it in a public space, that's fine, and I can get that question to them. I think the answer will be um, there will be some areas that they will know in advance that they will need to turn the power off, and there will be other areas that are last-minute switch-off disconnections. Just take the other question up here. Hi, um, my question's in line with the, the flow. Like, if, 
if it's uh, on the 1st of December we're about 90 or something and 150 at the border, is it a linear path of growth or is it a, you know, in that those two weeks, it's in the last few days that it'll jump up to that? I'll hand this one to Chrissy to answer. Um, we're expecting to see the, the rate of rise to start really picking up shortly. Um, uh, given we're what, the second week of November, we're sort of still expecting a peak in the first week of December. And that peak has, has been increasing the last few forecasts. Yeah, the, the rate of rise is going to pick up at the border and you'll see that travel down uh, to this part of the river. We then expect it's been pretty flat at the top. Like uh, our previous two big events coming down in 2016 and 2011, they rose and then they just dropped really fast. We're not expecting that at the moment with this event. We're expecting it's going to be a pretty fat peak and then it'll then go down slowly at the moment. The, the end of the, the hydrograph is, is um, really, is even more difficult to forecast what's going to happen at the end. But the Murray is notorious for dropping really quickly. We don't think that's the case this time. We think it's going to stay up high for a while. Okay. We'll do one more question and then I think we'll wrap it up before everyone disappears out of the room. Yeah? Okay, thank you for the presentation tonight. Sorry, is that better? So Mike, um, can you, or actually all of you, can you link all of your sites, the SA, uh, the SA government site, to your websites please, for everybody to access, because it just makes it easier for them? Um, Chrissy, the degree of accuracy around the forecasting, can you put a percentage on that? Sorry, got a couple. I'll ask them all and then you can. Ben, um, can you outline emergency works examples for, for us, please? Um, and also, will boats be restricted in residential and shack areas during um, peaks? Um, and then Donna, sorry, I'm assuming that outside of. Um, uh, Wakery that other ferries don't have variable, variable levels of operation. And Joshua, what about the water management by council with regards to LMAs? That's all right. Okay, I hope everyone's remembered their question. I'll hand over to Chrissy first. Um, at the moment, with the peak still uh, four or five weeks away, four weeks away. Um, fairly broad range, it will get better. We'll get better at predicting as it gets closer. We expect to be able to have a much improved forecast within a week because it's going to move into the part of the river where the, these different anna branches converge. So once it gets past the Wakul Junction, if you have a look, I've taken the MDBA website, it's got a really good little flow tracker on it. Once that peak moves past the Wakul Junction, we'll have much more confidence in what the flow is going to be at the South Australian border. At the moment, it's it's really easy to, to measure a water level. It's much harder to estimate a flow. And so f and flow is what we use to work out what the flow is going to be downstream. It's really hard to measure. It, some of those, uh, they, they could be plus or minus 20% of those high ranges. We just don't know. So we, and when it gets a bit further down the river, uh, that's when we'll have a, a better idea. Uh, in answer to your question about um, the other ferries, uh, no, Wakery is the only ferry that has a higher landing and they've actually, in the last, this week, actually been preparing the ordinary road that leads to it for the detour. Um, they're, they're suggesting at the moment, even with the higher peaks, that the lower lakes, like the Wellington, um, tail and bend ferries will still be operational. The risk we have there is the roads leading to the ferry could possibly be at risk. Uh, <clears throat> can we actually just have a chat about your question afterwards? Because I'll need a little bit more context to understand. So we might chat in more detail. Um, I think the question was around emergency work. So we've done our risk assessments um, and we're getting some independent engineering assessments of those. Uh, obviously, we've talked about road closures and swims. Um, we've had to shut down um, a number of roads and uh, swims across on a case-by-case -case basis. 
um, and we're also identifying as part of our road ma flood mapping um, those areas of greatest risk um, and putting contingencies around them. Thank you. And I've got one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, um, one thing that wasn't mentioned was cultural heritage sites. Um, we have reburied a few along the Murray, especially in Manham. Um, there will be a few more be coming up. If anyone sees any remains, just give the council a call and they'll, they'll give me a call and they'll come out and they'll deal with it. We, we got no GPSs on them and they will pop up. Um, especially the ones that we've just buried over 15 in Manham and they will be flooded, they'll probably be washed out so I'm going to go rebury them again. So if you see anything that don't look right, just give us a call. All right, one more. Um, with the rising rivers and the ferries closing, will there be assistance to get people from one, so one side of the river to the other in case of emergencies and such? Um, the emergency services are actually putting in place some strategies to make sure that there is still going to be emergency service coverage. Um, so generically there will be extra emergency services around um, because we will need to take into account the fact that we won't we also won't be able to um, necessarily go the, the normal routes that might normally be open so all right um, I'm going to I'll just I'll, one really important really, really small quick question um, are we going to restrict river travel because the last thing we need with people sandbagged up is a weight boat going through uh, yes, I will hand that to Donna. It's certainly not my area within the department, but from the information that I have received is that at some point there will be restrictions. I just can't give you that information right at this moment as to what those restrictions will be. I do believe that they have already started to lower speed limits for um, motorised boats, vehicles, whatever they call them on the river. Um, but just from the, the water levels and the flows and the risks to people, I do believe that there will be um, a notice that restricts um, the usage. All right, I'm really keen to let you all leave on time. So um, thank you so, so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate that you, uh, you're here getting information and trying to take some, um, some action to actually help yourselves stay safe. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers who came tonight. Please take as much information as you wish and take 20 copies of one thing if you want to and hand them around to everyone you know. And feel free to stand around and chat with any of the speakers as well if you've still got questions.